Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Day in the Life Docker Networking. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dan Finneran, EMEA Solutions Architect. Dan, I will now turn things over to you. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining this session, uh, Day in the Life Docker Networking. Uh, this session is predominantly going to touch on the various networking technologies that make up the Docker driver networking stack. Uh, and this is the agenda that we're going to cover today. So it's going to be the fundamentals of container Docker networking, the various networking drivers that uh, you can make use of when you are containerizing your applications with Docker containers and the Docker engine. And then we're going to go into the various drivers that are actually part of the Docker engine. So the bridge driver for host-based networking, the overlay driver, which allows you to share networking configuration and container networking across multiple hosts, some information around segregating the various types of networking traffic between your control and your data planes. We're going to look at the Mac VLAN driver for use cases where you need direct access to the underlying network, and then some Docker EE features, things like the HTTP routing mesh, and also things like load balancing and service discovery. And then at the end, there will be time for me to go through the questions that you've posted, uh, and we'll answer some of those for you, or all of them, uh, time permitting. So uh, we'll kick this off with the fundamentals um, and some information around the networking drivers. The fundamentals around networking, are that it's, it's pretty difficult. This is a, a simplistic diagram to the right-hand side showing you the various bits of uh, technology that make up a networking stack, so load balancers, routing, the actual servers themselves, firewalls. There are many components that make up a full networking stack. Uh, they all need to be managed and they all need to be configured correctly in order for applications to work correctly and for applications to be able to communicate properly uh, across all of these discrete components. Enter containers. Now, um, containers bring a whole new ideology, a whole new concept to how networking works across all of your various hosts. And with that, you, you know, you start to move away from having a few physical servers, then into tens to hundreds of virtual machines. All of a sudden, you can start to look at having hundreds or even thousands of containers on each host itself in the network. These containers can exist for seconds, minutes, in some cases months, but however, that is a lot of networking changes that can happen in a very short period of time. And these microservices that are distributed across all of these hosts introduce a lot of east-west traffic as well. So in the previous example, we, uh, we showed uh, the overall networking stack, hardware devices included. With this now, it, it does look like there may be a lot more complication that can be brought into the networking. So this session is really going to be about looking at the various technologies that exist as part of the Docker platform that can make your life a lot easier when you are either migrating applications or building new applications using Docker and Docker Enterprise Edition. So how have we tried to make it more simple, easier for you um, to use Docker and to use the Docker networking? Well, the Docker networking design philosophy is around kind of two key areas, portability and extensibility. The portability aspect really is that applications can behave identically in various different environments. So, you know, we'd want to simplify that where applications can move left and right in between different hosts and still operate in the same manner. And then the other concept is extensibility. So, you know, Docker provide a huge amount of functionality and technology, but they also add in the capability with their things like their APIs and their plugin infrastructure for you to extend that and in include additional functionality as well, along with exposing the API so that you can automate a lot of the tasks to ease scaling and deployment. So um, the main networking goals for Docker networking, as I've mentioned, pluggable. So bring in what you need and get that flexibility. Uh, the native user interface and the API. So using things like the Docker unified uh, universal control plane, 
Use that to automate the deployment of your services, your containers, or alternatively, you know, hit the API, write your own code if, if that's the way that you would like to automate those things, all there for you to use in order to ease the day-to-day -day life. A fully distributed network. So, you know, as your applications grow and scale, they can do that simply and easily whilst uh, ensuring that performance is still there. A decentralized network. So the capability to have your applications spread uh, and highly available. So in the event that a container or a host is suddenly missing from your pool of resource, we can automate the process of either bringing up additional resource or passing you over to services that are still available, keeping you up and running. Uh, out of the box support, so the ability to use Docker Enterprise Edition and get all of that functionality very easy and very straightforward. And then with the recent additions of things such as uh, Docker for Windows, Docker for the IBM Z series platform, for instance, all of that capability to work completely cross platform. So having swarm clusters, for instance, that work across your Windows servers, your Linux servers, all of those sorts of things. So a full cross cross platform infrastructure. So um, to do this, we have the um, container networking management. And to do that, we have lib network. So lib network is the Docker library that implements all of the key concepts that make up the CNM. Um, and as you can see here, you know, the lib network is all open source. You can read through the source code and you can automate all of that as well. It's an open standard that has been submitted and has taken a lot of bits of information on board from the community. So what is the lib network architecture? Um, as I've mentioned, it's a library, but it's also has the capability to have lots of input as well. So various networking drivers can be brought on board that are either native or remote. So the inbuilt drivers that I've mentioned, things like the overlay or the bridge, having native IP address allocation. So having the Docker engine, having the Docker lib network take care of all the allocation of IP addresses throughout your network infrastructure. If you're wanting to make use of external IP address uh, allocation management, then it's a case of having remote plugins that will take care of those sorts of things. And again, the same with remote network drivers as well, all giving you that pluggable and flexible um, design for dis distribu distributed networking. And inside of Lib Network, there's a lot of additional functionality as well that help things like scaling. So things like load balancing, things like service discovery, and things like having that control plane, which gives you a simple place to automate the deployment and the control of the control of your network. So how have we got to all of this? Well, as Docker is having the rolling releases, we're continuously adding in new features and new functionality. As more and more people um, submit requests or come up with new and interesting concepts that they're using um, Docker to automate their infrastructure, we're implementing all of that additional functionality to meet those requirements. So in Docker 1.7, we implemented uh, Lib Network in its first form, and we've been extending that as we've been moving forward. So the version after that, we added in service discovery. So as you deploy services onto your network, they become available across your entire cluster. The version after that, we added in the concepts of plugins, which allowed third-party vendors to write their own code that the Docker engine could extend onto and provide additional functionality through that. And then on and on, distributed DNS, uh, round-robin load balancing, so being able to have your distributed load spread across multiple hosts and work between all of those tasks to spread the load as you move around those that make up your service. Further load balancing, the integration into Swarm, the routing mesh, which I'll come on to later on, and then quite recently, things like HRM, so the HTTP routing mesh, and some host mode um, additional as well. All of this information is all available on the Docker site for you to read into more, um, but I'm gonna go through quite a few parts of this um, bits of uh, network infrastructure that we've implemented today. So containers and the container network model, um, what do they look like? Well, there are a few 
um, key parts to this. Most importantly being the container itself. So that's where your, um, your, your application, your code uh, lives. The endpoint, so that is essentially the network endpoint inside that container and the network that it will then um, fit onto. And then that is all wrapped around in the sandbox. So this is what the Docker engine actually provides. And when you build that all together into having multiple containers, you can see here that it becomes very easy to have uh, one particular container that sits on one network. Uh, once you're on that particular network, you can speak to other containers on the same network. You can have containers that are also multi-homed. Multi so for instance, at the moment, container one can quite happily speak to container two in the middle. However, container three is on an entirely separate network. So you have segregation there all managed internally inside of Docker. Uh, and all of that is managed through the sandboxing uh, and through the networking namespaces that exist inside of Docker and inside of LibNetwork. Um, you can see uh, drivers that are currently available for the version of Docker that you are currently running. So if you run the Docker info command and look down at the plugin section, uh, you will see what plugins are currently registered. The ones that we have here are all of the native drivers. So these are the ones that are built directly into Docker Engine. Um, one that I won't be talking about today is the null driver, um, but um, you know it's quite self-explanatory. If you create a container and attach it to the null network, it's essentially a black hole network in that there is no way or nowhere for traffic to go. It's a uh, completely frozen and isolated network. It's mainly going to be the other networks that we're going to be discussing today, so overlay, bridge, etc. So um, networks and containers, what, what does it all look like? How does it build up? Well, you can create a network and give it a name that you would like. So um, the docker network create command with the minus D flag, you can then specify the driver that you would like. So uh, docker network create minus D overlay and give that a name. And once you've created that network, um, you know, once you've created that network using that driver, all you need to do then is essentially do a docker run dash dash network, the name of the network that you've created. And then all of the steps will take place to um, build that namespace, utilize the driver that's been attached to the network name that you've created, attach that process, attach the container to that network, and then start the process. And there you go, you've isolated uh, everything that you are running and you've connected it to a network that you've just created and named accordingly. All of this makes it very easy for you to provide segregation, to provide a naming um, spe specification and attach everything to the, ne the network driver of your choice. So uh, as kind of a summary of the networking driver technology, so the CNM, it's open source container networking specification. And this has been contributed to the community by Docker. So as I've mentioned, LibNetwork, it's, it's open source. It's, it's an open specification for people to make recommendations to, to look at, um, to, to raise issues if they feel that there's something that could be done differently. The networking model defines the sandboxes, so the, the safety wrapping around that. It defines the endpoints that sit inside the, the sandbox. So this is the, the endpoint that allows a container to send information externally from the sandbox and then the endpoint needs connecting to a network. And LibNetwork is Docker's implementation of that container networking model. As I've mentioned, it's extensible via pluggable drivers. So if you look in the Docker store, you'll see a number of drivers from third-party vendors that allow, for instance, uh, you to work with their networking hardware, their networking infrastructure. And these drive, the drivers allow LibNetwork to support many other networking technologies as well. So things like software-defined networking or alternatives to IP address allocation management. And LibNetwork is cross-platform. So again, Linux, Windows, etc. And I've mentioned it's open source as well. And the idea behind all of it is just to simplify container networking and improve that application portability. So being able to scale, being able to deploy, 
where you need things to deploy, being able to have them uh, across multiple hosts, et cetera. Um, so the host networking fundamentals, Docker is not in the path of the data. So the concept behind this is that we are using uh, bits of technology that already exist inside the kernel, inside the, well, inside the Linux kernel, inside the Windows kernel, and then pass data down onto physical devices. So the Ethernet uh, network interface cards, which will then pass the data onto the external network. Essentially, Docker networking is Linux networking, and it is Windows networking. So very simple. We're not trying to get in the way of sending traffic from user space down to other areas of the network. We're just making use of existing key technologies. So Docker networking on Linux. Uh, we're making use of the Linux kernel technologies that already exist. So we're already using the existing TCP IP stack that's built in. We're using technologies such as VXLAN and DNS. So again, not reinventing the wheel here. We're also using a lot of Linux, care, Linux kernel networking features such as networking namespaces. So essentially being able to carve out a secure and uh, segregated area for networking endpoints uh, and connectivity. We're also using things like networking bridges, IP tables for firewall rules, for network address translation rules, and virtual ethernet devices as well. Um, so Linux bridges, they provide the layer two um, switching pretty much like a standard networking switch that you would find as a physical device. Networking namespaces we use for isolating a container's networking stack. Um, the virtual ethernet pairs, so they contain, uh, they are essentially the endpoints, they connect containers to the container networks. And then again, IP tables, so we use that for port mapping, so exposing services that are running inside a container for load balancing between multiple services or um, tasks that are running, and then for also providing network isolation as well. Uh, across the, the, you know, the two main platforms that we tend to look at, you know, we have comparable technologies that uh, apply the same sort of functionality. So on Linux, as I mentioned, we have the networking namespace, which segregates off um, various technologies and the way that containers speak to the rest of the network. On Windows, they're just called networking compartments. Again, Linux, so the Linux bridge, which allows a layer two device to exist in software. On Windows, that's just a V switch. Uh, and same down the rules there. So Ethernet devices, virtual NICs. And then for firewall, we have IP tables on Linux, and we have firewall and VFP rules on Windows. So again, comparable technologies, slightly different terminology. Um, so the fundamentals, you know, wrapping up this particular section, we have the native drivers that are provided directly into the Docker engine and lib network. And then we have plugin network drivers, which allow you to extend the Docker engine so that it can speak to other vendors. The native includes bridge, so essentially being able to connect two devices, whether one's physical and one's a container device across a layer two bridge. Uh, overlay, hosts, Mac VLAN, and IP VLAN. The Docker networking keeps all networking inside the Linux kernel, so everything is all part of, you know, uh, a very secure and uh, very trusted Linux kernel uh, execution path. And it's all simple connectivity, and we provide IP address management by default with many of the native Docker networking drivers. So with that, that's kind of a summary of the fundamentals and the built-in networking drivers. We're going to start to drill down now into some of the native drivers so that you can get an idea of um, how best to use them, where they would make sense for you if you're looking at um, moving from one environment to another or for building an application um, for the first time. So we're going to start with looking at the bridge driver. Um, this is essentially by default, the driver that most people will use. So if you essentially just do a, a Docker run and a container name, so Docker run Nginx, for instance, it will join a bridge network by default. And this is the, yeah, as I've mentioned, this is the, the default driver that is used. So um, what is Docker bridge networking? It's single host networking. So 
essentially the Docker bridge is inside a single host. It's default, it's simple to configure and troubleshoot. In fact, it's so simple it's actually turned on by default. So um, unless you really need to do something clever with it, it's already there for you to use. It's very useful in local de development. So what that means is you can connect many containers to this inside host bridge uh, and have, for instance, a full stack or full service that is running. Um, it's very robust, so it is. you will find it um, in a number of places. And it is used in some areas in production deployments. Um, a lot of people now are moving away to the overlay driver um, due to the uh, advanced functionality that you will get. And also that the Docker bridge is host only, so it's a local scope. Um, so how does it actually look under the covers? So each container is placed into its own networking namespace. So this is a Linux kernel uh, security domain, as it were. And then the bridge driver will create a bridge, um, a virtual switch, as it were, comparable to a physical switch where you would normally plug in physical devices inside a single Docker host. And then any container that is attached to that bridge can communicate with one another. Um, but as I've mentioned, the bridge is a private network, which means it's restricted to inside a single Docker host. Um, and what does that mean, for instance? So in this example, we have two Docker hosts. Uh, on Docker host number one, I have created two containers. Inside those containers, you'll see the virtual Ethernet pairs and the internal IP addresses that have been allocated. And then we have a second Docker host where I have started a, a single container that is up and running. Now, you may notice if you look at this that we have um, some identical IP addresses inside those bridged networks. The reason for this is that there is a standardized um, way of IP address allocation. So the Docker bridge network has its own IP address allocation management. And because these hosts are separate, they're not aware of one another, then all of the containers that you create that are part of that bridge will have, the, have an identical IP address allocation scheme. Now, this may seem troublesome, but because they're attached to that bridge, there is no external connectivity unless you provide that. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if you connect to container uh, one on the left-hand side on the host one, you can speak to other hosts that are part of that same bridge. However, if you go to the second host and try to connect to um, the IP address of one of the hosts on the uh, on uh, one of the containers on the first host, it's not aware of it. The bridge is essentially the endpoint down. There's no further no further way of communicating down. So I mean, this seems um, you know very good, secure, but it doesn't show how we have any external connectivity. We essentially have a private network inside a Docker host which is good for doing you know, development and testing, but you're going to want to expose some services once you have your application all containerized uh, and pushed up. So I will come to that shortly. So as I've mentioned, what is Docker bridge networking? You know, in, in these three hosts here, essentially containers on different, different bridge networks cannot speak to one another. So, you know, container A on Docker host number one is connected to its own bridge. It does not know, it has no networking access to any of these other containers. On host number two, B and C, they're on the same bridge, so they can speak to one another. However, on Docker host number three, we've created a bridge for each container. So again, even though they're inside the same host, they're actually on different bridge networks, so they can't speak to one another in that current networking design. So these are some of the um, key areas that you need to be aware of if you're using bridge networking for development for testing or for scoping out the architecture of your application as you deploy it. So as I mentioned, um, you can deploy you know, as many containers to a Docker bridge as you would like. However, they expose no external connectivity um, because that bridge is one level above. It kind of hides all of the containers that live behind it. So how do we expose any services that are running as part of those containers? Well, what we do is we use a thing called port mapping to do that. And this is quite simple. 
So in this example, um, there's a container that I want to run, which is container one. It's a web server, so it's exposing port 80. Um, for security reasons, it should be 443, but for simplicity, we'll keep it at 80 for this example. So when I do a Docker run, instead of just doing Docker run my web server, what I've passed it is the minus P flag and two port allocations here. Uh, and what do they mean? So uh, the, first, um, the first port number here, which is 8080, this is the host port. So this is the port that will be exposed on the physical um, adapter on the host itself. And then the second is the internal port, so the port that you want to expose on the container. And what that now means is that if you hit the IP address of the host itself, so the 172.14.3.55 address, and if you hit port 8080, that will now be mapped to that container host on port 80. And that's kind of how you do quite simplistic port mapping when using the bridge networking. So the bridge driver, um, it's simple behavior and it's very simple architecture. As I've mentioned, it's, it's deployed quite widely and it is very mature. So the, um, the bridge driver or the bridge technology has been part of the Linux kernel for a very long time. It allows containers on the same bridge network to communicate and it does offer some local service discovery. However, anything that's not part of that bridge network will not be able to speak to containers that are connected to it. But it does offer external access to those containers if you make use of port mapping. So that is how you expose the services that are running on those containers. But again, um, we've only really been looking at singular host only. Um, for applications that want to live, and this I imagine will be the majority of applications, will want to scale across multiple hosts. We need to look at how we're going to do that sort of thing. So with that, we have the Docker overlay driver. Um, so I'm going to go into how that looks and some of the key features that this provides. So what is Docker overlay networking? Quite simply put, the overlay driver provides and enables simple and secure multi-host networking. So any container that is connected to the overlay network can communicate. So C1 in this example can speak to three, four, five, six, and onwards. Any host that is connected to that overlay network can now communicate between one another through Docker's overlay networking functionality. Um, this is a quite high level picture. There is a lot kind of happens under the scenes, but I'm gonna go through what that technology is, how it looks. Uh, and essentially that overlay network hides a lot of the clever technology that happens on the underlay. So, you know, what is the, what is the reason for the overlay? What, what are the problems that it solves? Well, um, if you were to use just simply bridge networking, it becomes very hard for you to work out where your services are running. It becomes very hard for you to scale your services out. Uh, and you have to make use of doing all of that port exposure on each particular host. So very difficult. And it becomes um, kind of unmanageable at certain levels of scale. Uh, and it also, you know, it hampers scaling. It hampers simplicity as well. Um, so, you know, having all of your containers able to communicate on the same network, regardless of host, you know, that is essentially what orchestration needs in order to work. Uh, and this is because the overlay network spans all of those hosts. The orchestrator then, which places uh, containers as part of a service, can just spread the load quite easily without having to worry about where things are living. So uh, Docker overlay networking, it's portable. So it doesn't make a difference really where you are deploying your Docker engines, your Docker EE environment. It works in any cloud or an on-premise environment with little or no reconfiguration of existing physical networks. Um, and if, there are, you know, if there are any uh, VMware administrators on there, um, you know, using things like VLANs, you know, when you add in extra hosts, it is a case of ensuring that all of those VLANs need trunking down to the additional hosts that have been added. Well, the simplicity of this just means that as long as the management planes are all set up correctly, you can just keep adding hosts quite simply and the overlay will take care of all that. Much more simpler 
when you don't have to make changes to physical networking devices that connect all of your hosts together. The overlay network allows containers to see each other as if they're on that same layer two network. It's very simple to set up. So essentially um, a simple command pretty much in your Docker Swarm cluster and you will have an overlay network. And any containers that you then add to the overlay network again will be able to speak to one another. Um, the control plane is self-configuring and manages itself and it's totally transparent to the user. And security is a you know a key aspect of this. You know, one of the key reasons for looking at things like VLANs is that they give you that proper segregation of networking traffic. Um, well, what we do is to ensure that these sorts of things are secure. Overlay networking is encrypted by default. So all of the control plane, which does all of the configuration steps, that is all encrypted by default. And there is also the capability to encrypt any networking traffic that exists on the data plane as well. So any networking traffic that goes between containers can also be encrypted for, for um, secondary security reasons as well. And that's all done through the AES algorithm. So um, what is the technology that provides the, the overlay network? Well, what we do is we use the VXLAN technology to build that network. The VXLAN provides um, a tunnel essentially which is created through the underlay network. So what that essentially means is that we will we, we go down to the underlaying networks, but as far as the containers are concerned, they're speaking as if they're on the same network, regardless of how things look. And this allows you to have layer three transporting in that you can route between networks on the underlay, but as long as that connection still persists, the tunnel will still provide the same networking kind of across the board. Inside each host is a VTEP, so that's a VXLAN tunnel endpoint. And that is essentially where traffic enters the tunnel or where it exits the tunnel. So um, if you're sending traffic from a container on host one, if that container is not on that host, it's on a different host, then all traffic will hit the VTEP. It will go through that VXLAN tunnel, which ultimately will go down onto the layer three network and it will then make its way to the host where that container is running, where it will exit through that VTEP and be passed to that container. As far as the container is concerned, it does not know it's actually running on an overlay. And the VXLAN tunnels are scoped only really um, to the hosts that should have them. So if you're only really running um, a number of tasks on three out of 10 Docker hosts, they will only be the ones that have the VXLAN tunnels running on them. So, <coughs> pardon me, what does that look like? Um, so we have two fresh Docker hosts that aren't doing anything at the moment. And what we're going to do is we're going to deploy a service on them. So we're creating a new service. We're calling this service web. And we're asking for two replicas. What that will do is it will build that overlay network and it will deploy our two replicas. And we're using the Nginx uh, image here as well. So. What we have here is uh, an overlay network. These two hosts, uh, these two containers can speak to one another, even though the physical hosts are actually on different networks. So we're actually speaking across different routed networks. However, um, we're not exposing any connectivity here. So whilst these two can communicate between different hosts across different networks, there's no actual way to speak to those containers from the outside world. So again, if we run that command, but this time we're going to publish some publish ports, again, like we did previously on the bridge driver. Again, this will create the overlay network. It will create two replicas of the Nginx image, but it will also then expose port 8080 on every host that the, um, that these hosts, um, that every host is part of the swarm cluster. I'm gonna go into this in a little bit more detail later on, but essentially, if there are 10 hosts in this cluster, all of them will start exposing port 8080, even though there are only two replicas um, running. Now, this might sound a little bit strange, but I'll detail why this is actually a very important and very interesting uh, bit of functionality um, shortly. So um, again, a little bit more detail in terms of how this actually works. 
there is still a gateway that exists inside the Docker host. So each container essentially gets two IP addresses. One of them is an IP address on the overlay network. This is so that they can address each other. The other IP address, the 172 IP address, is so, is so that they can communicate with the outside world. Um, because obviously the overlay network is a theoretical network, it's a tunnel network. They need to get down to the actual physical network which connects them to the actual networking switches. So this is how um, under the covers a container actually connects to the outside world. But as far as a container is concerned, all of its actual application traffic will go down over the overlay network where it's encrypted between the two actual physical hosts or virtual hosts. Uh, I've shown you quickly the syntax, but it's pretty straightforward. Again, Docker service create, however many replicas you would like. Uh, what's the external port? So the port exposed by the host. And what's the internal port? As in what's the port that we want to connect to on the image that we're running? Um, we can separate all this out so you can see a little bit more. You can se separate the mode, whether it's ingress, um, what's the target port, what's the published port. Uh, you can also connect directly to the host as well. So there are a few um, different options there. So what are the benefits? You know, why, why go through this? So um, the overlay networking benefits are that it provides a secure, portable connectivity that's very easy to set up. As I mentioned, if everything is um, connected together using Docker Swarm, you do a Docker service create and everything is all up and running. That's pretty much all you need to do. The Swarm cluster will take care of ensuring that the connectivity is there between everything. Service discovery, so every node that is part of the cluster will know where those hosts are. So if you have 10 hosts, but you've only run into replicas, you can, you can quite easily find out where those two tasks are actually running, those two replicas. And there is also load balancing built in as well. So that's the overlay network. Um, and how that looks, how you set that up. There is really a, a, a key area here that's, that's a bit of a new bit of functionality that was added, which is separating out your two networks as it were. So um, when you initially configure your swarm cluster on host with multiple inf interfaces, you can separate out those two types of traffic. And this is pretty straightforward. So we have two hosts here. Each host has multiple interfaces and each are connected to different underlays. So when we do our swarm init here, we can say which interface we want to use as our data path, so traffic for inter-container speaking, and which interface we would like to use for the control path. So which interface is used to say, uh, I want to configure this host this way, etc. It's very straightforward. Once you do that, the overlay network will then be connected to the data path uh, ad advertised adapter. And in the case of when you add your additional nodes, passing them the same sorts of flags so that they know how exactly to connect to one another. Once you've done this, any services that you create will then only be part of the data plane. This means any of that data traffic is now physically segregated from all of the control traffic um, that would typically run on a shared interface. So um, we've gone through the overlay, so multi-host, we've gone through single host through the bridge driver. Um, we're gonna now look at the Mac VLAN driver. This is a, a pretty new driver that um, a lot of people have kind of asked for, and it's based upon technology that already exists inside the Linux kernel again. And what is it? So the Mac VLAN driver is a way to attach containers to existing networks and to existing VLANs. Um, and this is ideal for applications that are not ready to be completely containerized. So, you know, typically they may have hard-coded IP addresses or they may need direct access to the network for whatever reason. And as I mentioned, this uses the pre-existing Mac VLAN Linux networking functionality that is part of the kernel. Um, so what is Mac VLAN? Uh, or what is the functionality that you get from that? Each container gets a full MAC address, so a hardware MAC address. And because of that hardware address, it can also then get a full IP address on the underlay network. 
that typically means that it is now connected to the underlying networking stack. <coughs> it is a way to connect machines that are virtual and physical and to existing networks and VLANs. Each container is visible on the physical network. So what that means is that um, all of the containers that we've had before have all lived on a bridge or on the overlay network. These containers are connected directly pretty much to the wire. Uh, the parenting interface, so for instance, Ether0, has to be connected to that physical underlay. And it gives containers direct access to that network. So no port mapping, no bridges, etc. So anything that is exposed by that container is now available on that, the underlying network. And again, it allows you to trunk VLANs directly up to running processes inside your container. There is one requirement that it requires promiscuous mode. Um, that is because it has its own MAC address, so it needs to listen to uh, MAC address frames and, um, and you know, use MAC addresses that it wasn't originally meant to be doing. Um, as I've mentioned, yeah, MAC addresses, this is kind of what it would look like. Here we have um, a layer two network where we've got everything in the um, 10.0.0.0 slash 24 range. And um, every host here we can see is all on that underlay. So container one is all part of that same network. What this means is it can access virtual services at dot 68 or physical hosts at dot 25. From a networking perspective, what this looks like, there are no physical hosts running multiple containers. Everything is just connected directly to that network. All of their MAC addresses are exposed to the network and all of their IP addresses are connected to that network. Again, with um, sub-interfaces, it allows us to trunk multiple VLANs. So for instance, container, uh, <laughs> the container on the left here um, needs access to VLAN 10. Possibly there may be a security boundary for that. And again, the container on the right needs to go onto a separate um, VLAN as well. So we can trunk VLANs directly to the containers regarding whatever need it is, security boundaries, access to physical or virtual hosting, uh, and trunk those up and down. So a Mac VLAN summary. This allows containers to be plumbed into existing networks, into existing VLANs. It allows to integrate containers with existing applications. So if we want to migrate an application that has a requirement for layer two access, is old and has hard-coded IP addresses that can't be changed, Mac VLAN allows us to put those containers directly onto the network. It's very high performance, so there's no net natting required and there's no bridging. And again, each container, own MAC address and a routable IP on the physical underlay, so directly onto the network. Uh, I've covered some of the use cases there, but mainly, uh, you know, it's um, getting direct access to existing networks and VLANs. And again, one of those takeaways is that it does require promiscuous mode to be activated. So in a virtualized environment, that is one of the things that you'll need to enable on the uh, on that virtual machine that you've created there. Um, so I've covered a lot of the, the drivers that actually exist. Um, now we're gonna actually look at some of the services that are exposed that make it easier for you to do, uh, you create your services to load balance them and to automatically do that discovery as well. So what is service discovery? It is the ability to discover services within a swarm. So when I do a Docker service, uh, all of the uh, containers that are created, they're all registered, um, you know, with the swarm cluster. So if I do a service create um, my service, that will then be registered within the swarm. And then every task or replica that is created, they're also registered, they also register their name with the swarm cluster. This means it becomes very easy for hosts that are also part of that cluster to look up those names to find those services, to find those tasks. And there are DNS resolvers embedded inside the container of the engine, which provide that functionality inside of each host. So what does this actually look like? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, if I was to deploy um, my, uh, you know, Docker service, my service with three tasks in there, 
I will be given a VIP IP address, so a master IP address, and then each service will also be given an IP address as well. And then the key value store that lives as part of the Swarm cluster will be able to return all of this information and ensure that it's propagated across all of the hosts in the Swarm cluster. So very simplistic, again, not only IP address allocation management, but also service discovery and DNS across the entire cluster. Um, we can see here what we've actually got now is we have two services that are running. So we have two hosts. On both of those hosts, we have three tasks. So tasks one, two, and three. They're all part of the My Service uh, service that I've deployed. And we can see that they have the uh, virtual IP and each service has been given an IP address. We can also see that we've deployed a task one as well, so your service, which has been given, which is on its own overlay, it's been given its own IP address allocations. What that means is that it's an entirely separate service with its own entirely separate DNS entries, its own IP address allocation management, and you won't be able to see the two unless you expose, uh, again, services through exposed ports. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, when you create a service, it gets given a virtual IP for load balancing. So every service you create with the amount of replicas that are put underneath it, you get load balancing by hitting that virtual IP. It will ensure that everything is healthy before trying to use it. And behind the scenes, it uses the Linux kernel IPVS to do that layer load balancing. So every time that you hit the My Service, it will check all of the tasks are healthy and then it will pass you on to one of the um, service IP, um, IP addresses in that group. So that's how you get built in load balancing as part of the uh, services that you deploy inside a swarm cluster. Um, the discovery details, so when you do, when you start a service and register the tasks, that is all automatic and dynamic. All of the name to IP mappings are stored in the swarm key value store. And that's how all of it is propagated to all of the hosts that are part of the cluster. And then container DNS and the Docker engine DNS is used to resolve names. So inside every container, it runs a DNS resolver, which loops back to the Docker engine. And the Docker engine has that DNS service, which is continuously updated via details in the Swarm key value score, um, key value store. And as I've mentioned, the resolution is networking scopes as well. Um, so kind of looping back a little bit here, uh, we're gonna quickly discuss the routing mesh. So in the previous example with the overlay, um, I exposed ports and what does that actually mean? Well, uh, this is what the routing mesh actually means. So when you publish a service on a single port, it's actually published across the entire swarm. What you get is a special network called the ingress network and incoming traffic to that port will be handled by all of the nodes in that swarm cluster. And again, traffic is all load balanced via that VIP load balancing. Uh, what does that look like? So in this, we have three hosts, but I've only deployed two tasks. They're all on the overlay network. And what I've, what I've done is again, I've, I've exposed port 8080 and map that back to the tasks that are running as part of my service. Now the routing mesh will ensure no matter which port 8080 from all hosts inside that swarm cluster, it will always be mapped to a host that is actually running the task. So essentially providing load balancing, providing mapping inside the swarm cluster to where my task is running and also load balancing as well. So next time I hit port 8080 on host three, host two or host one, it will move on to the next IP address that is listed as part of that service. Uh, compared to uh, host mode, you can see, um, you know, the load balancer would need to be made aware of where those tasks are running. The load balance would need to be updated continuously as tasks stop and start on various hosts. With the overlay network and with that uh, routing, it doesn't make a difference where the tasks are moved to. Load balancing and the DNS service discovery 
ensure that we will always have access to those services um, that are running. Uh, and then finally, we're just going to look at some of the additional functionality that's been added inside Docker Enterprise Edition. And with this, this is the HTTP routing mesh. So this provides native application load balancing of requests. Um, and this provides some very, very clever functionality. What this does, it provides load balancing based on host names from the HTTP headers. Simply put, um, when we do a request on a port, it will look at the request name. So if I requested myservice.local, it will read that and then it can do routing based on what I've actually asked for, regardless of the, um, you know, dependent on the same port. So what this does is it allows multiple services to be accessed via the same published port. So we can have multiple web service applications all being exposed through port 443. But regard, um, looking at the HTTP headers, we will be routed to the correct service based on the request that we've made. Uh, this does require Docker Enterprise Edition, and it builds on top of that routing mesh that I briefly talked about. Uh, it's quite simple. When you create your service, you specify the network that you're going to use. So in this, it's the Universal Control Plane HTTP TP routing mesh network. And we also apply a label to it. The label is the uh, host name that we're going to use, which is going to be attached to that service. So uh, the flow, you do that, you assign HRM and UCP to the port, create that service and add that label. And then when the HTTP traffic hits that HRM port, it will get routed to that HRM service. We will look at the request header, so the, the name of the service that you want to have access to. It will then compare that to the labels that you have created when you created your service. And then that request is passed to the virtual IP of that service, where it is then load balanced and routed to the service that's actually running. Um, quite quickly, uh, we've created a uh, service with two examples, uh, both with fooexample.com. We've hit the HRM on host number three. All of that then will be routed to the correct network there. So, I mean, it's very simplistic. It's extending the routing mesh that I talked about um, previously. It frees up ports and it makes it very simple for you to do multiple things on site, on, inside the same network. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I can imagine that was quite a lot to take on board. There is quite a lot um, to look at. Key takeaways, kind of a summary. When you're moving your application, you know, into a containerized environment, if you can rehome into new networks and you can make use of a lot of new Docker networking features that will simplify the networking architecture, simplify the deployment and simplify that scaling as well. Overlay networks will provide you the capabilities to place workloads throughout your entire swarm cluster without being having to be aware of task location. So all of that DNS lookup, load balancing, virtual IP infrastructure, as I mentioned. And then when you do have those services that are tied to specific IP addresses, have hard-coded requirements, or um, specific networking requirements, through things like the Mac VLAN driver, they can still be deployed into containers using those sorts of things as well. So with that, thank you very much. And we will quickly go through um, some of the questions that have been posted. Yes, Dan, there is quite a bit of questions. Um, <laughs> so we might not have time for all of them. If you want to kind of go through the Q&A. Um, I can help. Yeah, I let me help. I was um, feeling some of them along the way. Yes, and uh, let me just highlight the few that I didn't get to. So there's one on uh, bridging with Docker requires enabling routing on Linux between interfaces. What are best practices for protecting Docker container to container networks in Linux from outside world? Uh, so ideally, you, from, from an outside world, you really should only be exposing um, the services that are required. So if you have, for instance, a multi-tiered application, Ideally, you only want to expose the front end um, ports that are required. So, you know, if your application is database middleware uh, front end, for instance, only expose the access to the front end and keep the rest of it all internal. Um, there's no point in exposing services that don't need access to the outside world. Great. 
uh, we have another one. Uh, what if we need to use an, uh, an external load balancer like F5? What's the recommended approach? So it's a very good question. Um, with external load balancers, it is a case of um, you can either point to a number of hosts that are exposing ports that are either part of a host-based network or as part of an overlay network, um, but you will get you know, load balancing on load balancing, as that were. But that does provide you again with additional health checks and additional scaling as well. So it's just a case of, as part of your external load balancer, putting in the IP addresses of your swarm cluster, and then regardless of which one it hits, it will then route that traffic to one of the hosts that are actually running the task inside the swarm cluster. Great. Next one we have is about Mac VLAN. Um, does Mac VLAN allow TwistLock to continue protecting the container? Um, that's a very good question. I don't know too much about TwistLock, so unfortunately I can't really answer that question at the moment. But I will take okay. a note on that. And um, Any questions that we can't answer, will we be able to do a frequently asked questions or anything like that to post somewhere? Yes, we can uh, do a follow-up blog post okay. uh, with all of these great questions being asked. <laughs> Um, there's one more on HRM. It, so HRM is run on, run as, a, oh, let me try to reword this. Uh, how will this perform with millions of requests? Can HRM scale somehow? Yes, so there is um, some numbers that have already been done as part of testing for customers that are already deploying HRM in large environments. Um, I don't have any of those numbers to hand right now, but I believe they are available either on success.docker.com or um, I believe there are some white papers that do all of that. But um, from a technology perspective, it is a, a case of um, you know a, a lookup on a lookup to to pass all of that traffic back and forth. So it does add a tiny bit of overhead, but um, from a scaling perspective, it is pretty um, lightweight. Great. Um, and I'm trying to think which last one we can address here. Uh, let's do this one. Um, <laughs> are there plans to implement routing protocols to the outside world to deliver alternate possibilities of reaching services instead of using a load balancer? Um, so if I understand that correctly, it's a case of just accessing services directly that are running as opposed to load balancing them. Um, the problem that we have is that as when you're part of an overlay network, you are essentially segregated from the underlying network, um, and we need to expose what is actually running so that you know end users can make use of it. So at the moment, the design for all of that is essentially to use uh, virtual IPs and load balance between them. Um, you know, there are other examples that you could use. So. With bridge driving, you could expose each of them individually and then load balance from the top or, or expose them. But that wouldn't work as a service. You'd have to manage that manually. Um, as I've mentioned, there are also the um, a number of other plug-in drivers that are part of the Docker store, um, which may provide that additional functionality for exposing services to the outside world as well. Okay. And I think the rest we will have to take to our blog post follow-up. Um, is there any final words from Melanie? Yep, thank you everyone. We had a, a great group, a lively group. We appreciate all your questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. This does conclude the webinar. And just a quick reminder that this session was recorded and a copy of that recording will be sent to you. Please be sure to register for upcoming Docker webinars at docker.com slash webinars and also check out docker.com slash events for upcoming customer events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.